You know who really deserves the biggest shout out for Packers versus Bears? I'd say it's all of us for sitting through that whole thing. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of our Party Time Brews. I'm your host, John Delray. Today, it is shout outs and get outs. A look back at Packers versus Bears from week 11. Look, after the Jaguars game, I put pretty it was not, but a win it was. And hey, <laughs> we just got a bye week and a loss to the Lions in between there, but we are right back in what is quickly becoming the theme of the season, at least thus far. Now, are there plenty of reasons for optimism? Yes, absolutely. Were there things that went well? Yes, absolutely. But coming out of the bye against what most people would judge to be an inferior opponent and winning by the very tip, like fingernail of a middle finger is not exactly what the Packers were obviously hoping for. But you never do apologize for a win, right? I know LaFleur even included that in his post-game speech. So there's a lot to go through here. I'm going to go through the shout outs, a couple mez. And then some get outs, the stuff that really did go wrong. Before that, though, my my overall thoughts on this. You know, in the pregame show, I listed here are the three things that I'm a little hesitant about. Yeah, individual matchups, sure, all that. But the three, like, overarching themes that I think if they go true, could go bad for the Packers. This is exactly what I wrote. I copied it verbatim from those notes. Number one, the Bears record at home. They are a far superior team at home than they are on the road. Yeah, that was number one. Number two, Thomas Brown being installed as the new OC and Packers not prepping correctly for a new O plus the spark of a new coach. Number three, the Packers are the Bears Super Bowl. Matt LaFleur has not always had the team the most ready coming out of the bye. This could be a bad mix. I don't want to say I'm Johnny Carson with an envelope or anything, but like, mm-hmm. And then, now, luckily for Green Bay, all three of those basically did come true, and they still were able to get the win. One really important thing to notice here is last year, the Jacksonville game. Other games this year, last year, these games are lost. This year, in a sign of progress, maybe not the progress we hoped for, progress nonetheless, these games are still wins for the seven and three Packers. So just looking at these three keys a little bit more. Yeah, Bears are a way better team at home. Okay, fine, whatever. But then number two, Thomas Brown being installed as the offensive coordinator. We knew what he had done in Carolina. We knew that he was a former NFL running back. We knew that his theory on rookie QBs is to protect, 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 run the ball a lot, and have him keep it within 10 yards. What uh, what game plan did the Bears roll out with? Exactly the one that the Packers should have been prepared for. Like Thomas Brown ran what was probably the most obvious possible thing. The one wrinkle that I would give you know, credit for truly being inventive and like not seeing coming is all the QB options for Caleb Williams. Nope, didn't think that that was going to be an ingredient. But running the ball a ton? Yeah, absolutely. It's Thomas Brown. His first four games as a play caller in Carolina last year at over 30 carries each. And then beyond that, keeping everything with 10 tenure, it's what he did with Bryce Young. It's the best way to fix Caleb Williams coming off of multiple god-awful games. Like it was just, it was so obvious what the Bears we're going to try to roll out with. And the Packers just seemingly kept defending them like a team, the same team that they had been for the weeks leading up to this game. It's like they didn't really want to account for a new coordinator that was going to be doing quick out after quick out after quick out with a little slant mixed in. And then the, still the corners are playing six, seven yards off. It just nothing made sense in that regard. It, this is truly the first game this year where I've looked at the defense and gone, your plan was just wrong. And that's so frustrating. And then, yes, coming out of the bye, the Packers under Matt LaFleur have not 
Ben. Great. We know that the Packers are the Bears Super Bowl, right? Like you listen to Bears fans, players even talk in June, July, and August. And every time it's behind, I gotta beat the Packers. I gotta be the only thing that matters. <laughs> While the Packers are talking about like winning Super Bowls, right? Big case of little brother syndrome going on. And I would know I'm a baby in the family. But I mean, we knew that that was going to be the case. Lafleur now, six years head coach, three and three coming out of the bye. Losses in the last two. Last year was a pitiful performance against Denver. This year, while they did eke out a win, still the team didn't exactly look fired up for this game. They came into this game with a general malaise that just kind of matched the gray sky in Chicago during the game. But just to wrap up my overall thoughts here, was it well planned for? Mm-mm. The offense, the hey, the offense still did pretty well. We're going to talk about that. But the defense, man, it was a frustrating watch, right? And credit where it is due. The Bears played a much better game than they really had in several weeks. That defense is legit. That red zone defense is incredible. And the offense, with competency at the helm, showed it could be productive. So, credit where it's due. The Bears are making progress. Packers are still better, even if it is just by a fingernail. So, let's get to it. Let's go to the shoutouts first. Let's get to... The positive news. Who deserves the first shout out? That would be Carl Brooks's middle finger. Not necessarily all Carl Brooks, but at least the middle finger. His tip saved the game, saved a win, kept the playoff chances for the season on the positive side of 50%. The overall defense, I already talked about it, had a miserable game. The special teams, a miserable decade. So what saves the game? A defender on special teams. Of course, the script writers are just cruel. Also, it is really necessary here to give a shout out to Rich Bisaccia, right? The players talked about it. Lafleur talked about it. Rich noticed what the Bears have been doing with their long snapper and said, this is what we need to exploit. And this is how you're going to do it. And then the Packers did it. And all the talk from, I saw like there was a clip going around from the eternally intelligent Pat McAfee uh, talking about how like, whether there should have been a penalty call. No, this has all been settled. Even uh, I saw people commentating on, I didn't watch it myself, but saw people commentating on how Football Zebras has talked about like, this is a thing for the Bears. Their long snapper is slow to get up. They're trying to goat teams into penalties. So it shouldn't be called when this happens. Lo and behold, it wasn't called. And that is the correct call per the rules. So big, big credit to Rich Bisaccia, who, yeah, has deserved a fair amount of criticism. But this case, hmm, job well done. Next up, let's take a look at shout out number two, Christian Watson. Spoke just last week about how one of the keys to unlocking this offense is giving him more chances, more targets. He didn't get a whole bunch more targets, but look, four targets, four catches, 150 yards, 100% completion percentage when targeted. And the man through 11 weeks still does not have a drop on the season. The only receiver that's really getting anything in target wise that can actually claim that. And it wasn't just a diving catch on the final drive. It, it, it was also fighting for a ball on the second half deep ball. One of the largest complaints with Watson over the last few years is that he hasn't used his larger body to really bully small corners, right? He finally did, and it worked. What's truly funny about Christian Watson's third year is his usage is just odd right now. Like he's not getting the production from, like he's not becoming this alpha receiver that maybe we expected him to become, right? Like at all. He's not even a tremendous deep threat this year, piling on 40 yard catch after, no, he's not doing that either. But yet in this weird way, he's putting in more of a complete, well-rounded effort as a receiver than we've ever seen before. His yards per, per route run, highest of his career. His contested catch percentage, highest of his career. His run blocking, while still a touch inconsistent, the peaks are higher than they've ever been. And he's close to already notching several career highs in terms of cumulative stats, all while not having a single game with more than four catches. He needs more chances for the offense to really open up. He's, I would say, weirdly, 
becoming one of the more reliable receivers on the team, which we really didn't see coming, did we? I'm not saying you force feed him 10 catches on all these quick little things. That's not his game. But I'd love to see some of the intermediate crossers of his rookie year come back. I'd love to see more designed shots for him that actually stand a chance and aren't just the sacrificial lamb deep shots to try to open it up where he's more decoy than anything. Christian Watson coming along as a complete receiver. Next up. Yeah, let's talk about most of Jordan Love's performance. We'll, we'll talk about the bad. But the most? It was really good. Like, really good. Keep in mind, when it came to the Packers' offensive performance, okay, a couple things here. One, they scored above the average points against the Bears' D than they had gotten all season, right? I talked in the pregame show about how the Bears have only given up 20 a couple times. Well, the Bears did it, or the Packers did it. Right? And that was while getting crushed on time of percentage, the uh, time of possession. The Bears had 36 minutes time of possession. The Packers, 23. A 13-minute gap in that is massive. And yet, the Packers performed better than the averages against this defense. Ultimately, on the day, Jordan Love was 13 of 17, a 76.5% completion percentage. One touchdown, one pick, 261 yards, one rushing touchdown, 15.4 yards per attempt, which is just stupid good, and a 113 QB rating. Look, realistically, we take that stat line every single day of the week and twice last Sunday. And here's the thing. Like, coming into this game, going into the bye, what were some of our major gripes with what Jordan Love was doing to this point on the year, right? Hero ball, trying to get all the points on every throw. A lot of deep shots, right? Not taking the easy stuff when it's there. Not taking his simplified check downs just to get first downs, right? The thing is, only two of his 17 dropbacks actually traveled more than 20 yards in the air. And on those throws, he was two of two. Another gripe. He's got to play better under pressure. Second half last year, he was incredible under pressure. He's not doing it all this year. Uh, against the Bears, under pressure, he was 8 for 8 for 185 yards passing. Okay, but then he's got to get under center more. Now he's healthy. He's got to get under center more. It's got to open up the play action game. Well, he was more under center than really since we had seen all year since the injury started to pile on. And as for play action, 6 of 7 for 116 yards. So no, this wasn't the most highlight-worthy game of his career, but you want to talk about efficiency. You want to talk about not playing hero ball. You want to talk about doing the job that needs to be done while still getting a couple of the large pass plays. Huh. I mean, this was actually a very, very impressive performance by Jordan Love. And frankly, it answered a lot of the things that we were looking for. It just didn't have that many highlights attached to it. Really, really good performance by Jordan Love. And now you just kind of have the feel of like, okay, okay, do that again. Don't be boneheaded in the red zone. Couple more highlight style. Oh, oh, and we're back. That's what we got to hope for, right? One last shout out, Josh Jacobs. The man just keeps on chugging. Like I talked in the watch party, gave some numbers about how like he's one of the best in the league. It runs over 10 yards. And then when it comes to runs under 15, he's not doing great at all or it runs over 15 i'm sorry he's really not doing great in that regard like kind of below average actually by some numbers but ultimately in this game 18 carries for 76 yards and a touchdown and yeah his long was 12 he can't break 15 to save his life but he also contributed as a receiver four targets four catches not a drop not some errant throw either four targets four catches another 58 yards over 120 total cumulative yards for Josh Jacobs. The man just keeps chugging along. All right, let's go to a couple meh. A couple like, eh, there was good and bad, right? And it might feel weird to include him on this list, but I'm going to go with Brandon Cox Jr. Two pressures, a sack, two tackles, two stops, all in only 21 snaps. Really, really impressive stuff. A great debut on the season. First career sack even included. But, and he probably would be on the shout out list if it weren't for just one thing. My man got fooled on some options. And it wouldn't be so egregious if it happened on like the first one, right? That first one that everyone had every reason to like not know that a Caleb Williams option was coming. But Cox, he misdiagnosed some of the latter ones. And unfortunately in this game, that was a pretty big impact. And it kind of showed too 
while even though the potential is just so sky high and you know he can rush the passer, kind of showed why he's still a little bit of a project too. So huge jump displayed by Brenton Cox Jr. Definitely more positive than negative. But I wanted to put him in meh because while this game was such a reminder of his potential, it also wound up being a reminder of the work to be done. Next up, Rashawn Gary. Like outside of the sack by Brenton Cox and the push from TJ Slayton, Rashawn Gary was the only form of pass rush in this game like it all. The numbers themselves, they're pretty good just for Rashawn, right? Five tackles, all five are stops. One sack, five pressures, three hurries, 21.4 pass rush win percentage. All that is really good. And, and, and for what it's worth, the Bears did have both of their starting tackles back. So better protection, not to mention protection scheming from Thomas Brown, was kind of to be expected coming off of that nine sack effort from the Patriots the week prior against the Bears. I didn't really expect the Packers to completely, like, do that again. And Rashawn Gary's kind of emblematic of this. Rashawn Gary did good. Got a sack. Five pressures. Three hurries. That's all good. But was it enough for him to be Rashawn Gary? And that's kind of been the thing with Rashawn. He's like, even, even in games this year, like there's been his, like his disappearing acts, but there's even been games this year where like the good still has this kind of question attached to his like, well, is it good enough? And I know the other side of the line opposite from him, whether it was Preston when he was here, whether it's LVN, whether it's Enigbare, really anybody has been just empty. And that obviously hurts Rashawn's efforts, right? But still, we're not seeing Gary. And I know the chip rate. I know the double team rate. Gary is being respected from a blocking standpoint. Like he's still one of the best in the NFL. But the production just hasn't been matching this year. So while this overall was a good game, you just needed more. And that's kind of where the whole pass rush is. All right, let's go to the get outs. Speaking of pass rush and D lineman, Kenny... Oh, man, Kenny, I don't have some long diatribe here, but one of the Packers quote unquote best players logged another game with a PFF grade around 50. My man played 48 snaps and didn't log a single stat, not even a soft stat, not a single tackle, not a single pressure, not a single indication that he was there at all besides the snap counter sitting at 48. And I know, I know, I know. We don't want to get into just like box score scouting. There's obviously bigger impacts that you can have on the game than that. It's not everything. I get it. But Clark has consistently, consistently been among the lowest, greatest graded defenders on the year. He consistently has had pretty barren box scores. And just from the eye test, do you see him making the stops, the sacks, the disruptions, the pressures that we all have seen from Kenny for years? They've become the hallmarks of his career. And this year, they're just not there. There are a number of linemen, LVN, Barry even now, a number of linemen who are struggling in this new scheme. But considering the expectations for Kenny Clark in this new scheme, I dare say no one is struggling more than him. Speaking of struggling more than anyone else, let's talk about Quay. He played every single defensive snap. Over 70 damn snaps he was on the field. On the final drive, he had a kill shot on Caleb Williams. An absolute, all you got, he's right there. Just run and hit him. Nope, didn't do it. Instead, he stuttered, and then Caleb got the ball off. Now, he probably stuttered because of the coaching adjustments. That's the stupidest irony in all of this. He probably stuttered because he was told, hey, Caleb may run. Be ready for that. But the one time, he's got a completely uncontested kill shot, and he doesn't even take it. And that does nothing to speak about the fact that like, other times he just looked lost. In coverage, he was credited with three targets at him. He gave up two catches on it. Now, in all transparency, that one that he did not allow the catch on was a hell of a pass breakup. Let's give that to him. 
but he is just a prime example at this point. If you can have all of the athleticism in the world, all of the natural gifts in the world, and it just doesn't matter if you don't know where to go and you can't stay disciplined in your assignments. And granted, none of us out here, we don't know what the true assignments are. But there are several clips out there, several highlights, where, boy, it really looks like Quay Walker is traveling out of his zone to go do something else, and then he gets burned on the back end. And side point? Halfley! Halfley! Jeff! Why? Why is Quay Walker playing this much? He is one of, I, I won't deny it, I've talked about it before, he's one of the best tacklers on the team. He missed two on Sunday. If the man can't even tackle when they run straight into him, what are we doing? I mean, no. Is Eric Wilson a perfect player? No, he's not. He gets blown up on blocks sometimes. Is Edrin Cooper a perfect player? No, absolutely not. He sometimes actively looks like a chicken with his head cut off running around out there as a rookie. Is Isaiah McDuffie a perfect player? No, far from it. But we know what Quay is at this point. And it just seems so foolhardy to continue to wish that all of a sudden he's going to become the, the, what should be the green dot wearer. I know he wears the green dot, but like, should he? And it, 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 I just don't understand this optimism, this hope, even what they're saying at the press conferences about like, well, he's, he's doing well. <laughs> is he? I know PFF graded him not horribly in the game on Sunday. And that's fine for this one isolated thing, but man, we all see it. I'd love him to fix every single issue he has. I'd love for him to be able to read an offense like that tomorrow. I'd love for the athleticism and the awareness on the field to match. But they're just not yet. In year three, we've reason to believe that it's never going to happen. So why are we playing them every single snap next one the pick from love jordan <laughs> look look i know i said in the watch party like now watch because like after um <laughs> after that pick that he threw like we're gonna hear about how tucker craft shorted the route or whatever no honestly this time nope jordan matt lafleur they all agreed yeah that one just sailed on me like, there's always something in the red zone that derails what the Packers are doing, right? There's just always something with Jordan Love. And it's not just looking Favre-like anymore. It's starting to really feel like it. If you were around at that time, like, think back. We all knew as Packers fans watching Brett Favre that the, any possible throw could have any possible outcome. It may be the most incredible throw of your life. It may be a terrible throw that winds up in the defender's hands. It may be... I just, it may be the most incredible thing in one throw, right? Like, we all know it. We know exactly what I'm saying. And there also with Favre was this feeling of, like, impending doom that every possible outcome also included bad ones. And we've seen this script play out before. And if a pick hasn't happened yet, oh, just give it time. Like, <laughs> it's coming. Now, in this game... It wasn't decision-making. It wasn't... Because even Matt LaFleur said it was the perfect read. They wanted to get Kraft the ball. He put too much on the throw. It sailed on him. And that's going to happen. And at least in this game, it was in a remarkably efficient, really, really, really good game for Jordan Love. But man, there's always something. And that's what we just have to get rid of. It wasn't decision-making. wasn't hero ball. Ay yay yay. It's those little somethings that are stopping them from being the offense that they were in the second half of the year last year. And that's what's got to go. Because against the playoff team, or in the playoffs, it will cost them. Last get out. The game plan? Like, all of it? Now, defensively, yeah, no. Throw it in the dumpster. I despised it. I Going against wide receivers who are going to run routes within 10 yards, why are you playing five yards off? What, what are we doing? Is Joe Barry back? Because that's kind of what it looked like. Why are they able to run simple four-yard outs and have our corners react after they're already out on the out? You know, what? I, it's exasperating, really, to know that 
we just watched the Joe Barry style defense again. And it just doesn't make any sense. And I talked about that a bunch already. But like even looking at the offensive side. Now, yeah, in the watch party, like I didn't despise it. And I guess I still don't because it's one of those like if it works, you're not saying a darn word bad about it. But yes, it is foolish after losing five to do a sweep with Jaden Reed around the side. Yeah, that's foolish. Especially running it into an imbalanced defense. That goes from foolish to just like stupid. And Jaden Reed got crushed. Especially when Josh Jacobs was actually running pretty darn well. Like eventually with Josh Jacobs, you could just line up and be like, hey, we're within the 10. Just go do it. Run forward. Hit him hard. Okay, good. Touchdown. <laughs> and yet, man, we just didn't do that. So I said on the watch party, look, in high school, you get handed the football or like the bag of flour if you've got a fumbling problem and you are not allowed, whether you're in chemistry or biology or at home, that thing is staying on your arm. I remain convinced that the Packers, in order to fix this red zone offense, just break out the tents. Y'all are sleeping with it from the 20 to the end zone at Lambeau Field and you're not allowed to leave until y'all figure out how to do this. Because there is no reason why a team that's in the top 10 of DVOA offensively leading in amongst the league leaders and points per game, like all these positive things about the offense. The offense truly has been really good this year. But the red zone, why is it such a problem? And until they can figure it out, you live there. <laughs> that's just the truth. And, and that's the thing. It's not even, it doesn't even look schematic. Yes, there's the occasional bonehead call like a read, a read sweep, but it's just execution. It's just all the little things that all seem to pile up in just one area of the field. Got to fix it. And now, now we get San Francisco and hey, they beat San Fran. They, uh, they might be the foot on the neck of San Francisco 49ers playoff chances. We could get used to that. So let's hope for victory. Join me tomorrow for Lombardi Time Brews Live, where Claudia and I will be sitting here to answer all of your questions, chat about the Green Bay Packers, and then, of course, on Friday, previewing Niners versus Packers. Thanks so much for joining me here. Do hope you've had a great day. And as always, Go Pack Go!